Dr. Pamela Ruick, Extension Milk Quality Veterinarian for the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Welcome back to our continuing series on mastitis control. Today we're rolling out a new series looking at pathogen-specific mastitis control programs. And we're starting that series by focusing on control of mastitis caused by the mycoplasma organism. Initially, this was a problem that we heard of happening in the large herds in the western U.S. However, in the last uh, 10 to 20 or 30 years, this organism has been recognized worldwide, and while mycoplasmas aren't the most common cause of mastitis on dairy farms, they do uh, affect cattle worldwide, and they cause a variety of diseases in dairy cattle. Now, the thing that's kind of unique about these mycoplasmas is they don't just cause mastitis. Various mycoplasma species have been associated with a variety of diseases in both dairy cattle and in beef cattle. One disease that is common to both dairy and beef cattle is non-responsive bovine respiratory disease. In beef cattle it's referred to as BRD. In dairy cattle we often just call it pneumonia. Um, other diseases that have been associated with mycoplasmas are reproductive disorders, joint disorders, ear infections in calves, um, uh, uh, reproductive problems, and of course mastitis. When we think about the various types of species of mycoplasma that are associated with the disease, it's very apparent that while many of them can cause disease, mycoplasma bovis is the most significant mastitis pathogen and it's the one we'll be discussing today. Now, when we think about recognizing the occurrence of mycoplasma mastitis in dairy herds, people often think about the classic description which Dr. Uh, Jasper described in the oh, late 60s, early 70s in California. That classic description was really um, severe clinical signs of mastitis in multiple quarters of a single cow, dramatic drops in milk production, dramatically abnormal milk. Now, we still do sometimes see herds that recognize outbreaks that appear like that, but the reality of mycoplasma mastitis today should, is that it presents with a huge variety of clinical symptoms depending on the herd and depending on the level of previous exposure of those animals to the mycoplasma organism. So the take home message really today is that mycoplasma can cause both clinical and subclinical mastitis, and that mastitis can present in a variety of signs. It's also important to recognize that there's asymptomatic carriers in the herd. In these asymptomatic carriers, you may have periods where the animal is in a subclinical state and producing large amounts of milk, and then you may have um, episodes of mild clinical mastitis, or you may have a cow that gets very, very sick and then um, almost dries up. So the take home message is a variation in presentation. So if you're suspecting mycoplasma uh, as part of your mastitis problem on your farm, you really need to be looking hard at arriving at a diagnosis. Now arriving at a diagnosis for mycoplasma mastitis is also kind of tricky. Not every laboratory can culture this organism successfully. The diagnosis requires specific laboratory techniques and experienced technicians who can read the culture plates, typically using um, magnification. Uh, diagnosis of mycoplasma mastitis is also complicated because the uh, organism uh, doesn't always shed in infected cattle. So while um, there's studies that have documented that infected cattle can um, be persistently infected and shedding the organisms for months or even um, potentially years, the shedding may be sporadic. So you may take a milk sample from an animal that you suspect has all the symptoms of having mycoplasma. Uh, maybe the animal has a high cell count, but you take that sample into a good laboratory, have the culture work done, and it may come up negative. So these false negative samples are not uncommon. When you're looking to diagnose it in a herd, it's very important to be persistent, sample the right animals, and keep those animals as suspect animals if you don't get 
the um, expected result the first time you sample it. So when um, we have mastitis caused by mycoplasma in a dairy herd, we have to think about how this organism can be transmitted to other healthy animals. And this is, again, a tricky bug. Uh, the mycoplasma organism can behave as a classic contagious mastitis organism. In other words, um, it can spread to healthy cows when they come in contact with the organism in milk that came from a subclinically infected udder of a infected cow. So, you know, you can have that spread at milking time when the teats of a healthy cow come in contact with milk that came from an infected udder. But that's not the only way that this organism can spread. This organism can also be transmitted from infected lungs through the um, aerosol spread or uh, to, um, through the barn to a healthy animal. The animal can develop a colonization in their lungs and then when the organism is in the lungs, there can, uh, the organism may multiply to the point where there's so much inflammation that it can spread into the bloodstream and be transmitted through the bloodstream to the udder of a cow and then cause mastitis. This is absolutely unique to the mycoplasma organism. And it happens because it's such a tiny little organism and it has such an attraction for what we call mucosal surfaces like on the lung and in the udder. So this transmission by multiple routes is unique to mycoplasma and makes it a very dangerous organism within our herds. It's also important to recognize that one of the common sources of infection of a herd that hasn't had mycoplasma is a purchase of cows um, and commingling of cows from multiple herds. So um, a really common history I'll get when people call me about this is uh, they purchased some cattle. The cattle had a history of uh, respiratory disease either before they got to the farm or immediately upon transport after they arrive at the farm. And after that we get transmission that ends up being both a uh, history of non-responsive pneumonia in these cattle and also uh, mycoplasma mastitis. So we really have to look at understanding how this organism can move around herds and being very careful with our segregation programs. After we've identified that there are in animals infected with mycoplasma bovis within a dairy herd, the next step we have to take is how do we control it? Well, the bad news is there's simply no effective treatments. So um, there's no reason to give these animals antibiotics because these antibiotics are totally ineffective. Uh, so what we really need to do is identify all of the infected animals and cull them. And we want to cull them so that they do not transmit the organism to other animals. This is not the type of mastitis infection that should be dealt with by drying off a single infected quarter and continuing to keep that animal in the herd. Remember, this organism can live in the lungs uh, of infected animals and it can be transmitted by these asymptomatic carriers to other animals. So ideally, for the health of the total herd, we need to identify all the infected animals and remove them from the herd. It's also important to continue surveillance of the herd even after we think we've gotten rid of um, the animals which tested positive. I recommend doing weekly bulk tank cultures after identification of a single positive animal and then follow that up with individual animal sampling um, of suspect animals. We have to think about stopping transmission. We don't want to feed the waste milk from animals that are affected with mycoplasma mastitis to the calves because those, those calves can develop many of the other infections such as ear infections in baby calves um, and become colonized with this organism and uh, they can end up being asymptomatic carriers later on themselves. When we find these positive animals we all also have to take precautions to make sure that we're controlling the herd situation. And there's some management things we can do to uh, control the spread of mycoplasma within a herd. First of all, never house the sick cows with the newly calved or fresh cows. These fresh cows are our most vulnerable animals and we really don't want to risk that transmission from those sick animals to those immunosuppressed fresh animals. Um, another step we can take dealing with these fresh animals is don't milk the fresh cows using milking equipment 
that's been used on the sick cows. Remember, mycoplasmas can be transmitted in both an airborne fashion and through contact with infected milk. So we have to make sure to look at really strict hygienic circumstances to prevent that possible transmission. And then finally, another really common sense um, point of control is never mingle uh, newly purchased cows with the existing herd. That's a really important step because we know that's a huge risk factor for transmission of this organism to the healthy animals. Now another question I get sometimes is, um, well, uh, you've got a, you're doing bulk tank surveillance for mycoplasma and the bulk tank culture comes up positive. And I'll often get calls from somebody who say, hey, we got a positive culture on our bulk tank, but my herd just doesn't seem to have um, the mycoplasma scenario. Well, my answer to that is if you've got a herd situation that is not consistent with a probable outbreak, in other words, you don't have a lot of new clinical cases, your bulk tank somatic cell count is low, you don't have a lot of mastitis with multiple quarter infections, and you don't have a respiratory disease outbreak going on. My, my advice in that scenario is take another bulk tank sample before you panic. Confirm the diagnosis before you go on. Then review all of your herd data. Look at the rate of clinical cases, look at the somatic cell count of the bulk tank and of individual cows. Look at the history of other diseases in the herd. Is there increased pneumonia? Is there increased lameness? Look at the history of uh, purchase and movement of cows. Um, if there hasn't been any purchase or movement of cows, um, then you're a, a lower risk herd. Uh, make sure you culture clinical cases of mastitis and make sure you take a look at um, the uh, presentation of those clinical cases. If you have many animals that have multiple quarter infections and recurrence, that's a risk factor that should not be disregarded. Finally, we have to look at preventing mycoplasma from ever striking your herd. And the best way to do that is to have a good mastitis biosecurity program in place. We want to prevent the uh, introduction of infected cattle into the herd. If you're going to buy cattle, buy low-risk cattle from healthy herds. Ideally, you want to buy animals that have never calved and have never milked. These are the, um, the lowest risk animals you can buy. Don't commingle those new animals immediately with your existing herd. Uh, keep those animals grouped together and separate from the herd until they've had a chance to get adjusted and until you've had a chance to test them to make sure they're not infected. You also want to consider um, uh, never ever purchasing uh, a lactating dairy cattle without a complete understanding of their somatic cell count and clinical mastitis history. And finally, of course, never purchase cattle from unknown sources. This is an extremely risky practice and often results in bad consequences for the herd.